Hi, everybody. How are you? Uh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Francesca Tamilli, and I'm the Director of Communications and Office Functions at Telephone Canada. Does my voice sound as low as I think it does? It's good. Thank you. I don't know if I can. First of all, I want to thank Tiff very much for giving us this platform to be able to present these types of panels. It's really important for Telephone to continue sharing this type of industry knowledge because for us, uh, selling your content and having the audience find your content is the most important thing. And I would be remiss without saying congratulations, Tiff, 40 years. Uh, I can't wait to be 40 in seven or eight years. <laughs> So uh, for those of you who are our first Talent to Watch panel on Friday successfully addressed creative filmmaking without much cash. The last panel tomorrow will look at alternative, we're in Canada. The last panel will look at alternative routes for distribution, specifically the role of artists in building audiences for independent cinema outside the traditional distribution network. Building audiences have become both easier and more complex. Social media and the birth of digital natives, particularly millennials, are truly game changers for marketers and content creators. We all spend hours consuming content, and we don't just consume, we share and we comment. But for the millennials, it's even more intense. They want to maintain an in-the-know status 24-7 curating and influencing. Their Netflix queue is immense. They're 35% of the movie going public and can make or break a movie. 62% attend a film's opening week and 27% an opening weekend. They listen to each other, 84% make purchases based on word of mouth recommendations. But to cut through that noise and gain traction with millennials, we have to understand audiences early. Learning their behaviors about how they watch will help us target our marketing efforts. Marketing is therefore a real priority for Telefilm as we promote the extraordinary body of work of the talented Canadian filmmakers that we have. And we're actively developing diverse initiatives and strategic partnerships to celebrate and raise awareness about the Canadian cinema brand to our audiences. So here at TIFF, we have our third, uh, one of the things we're doing is Tuesday night, we're having our third annual partnership with Maison Burks to pay tribute to this year's Canadian Women in Film. Yesterday, if those of you might have braved the cold and the wind, we had uh, our second annual live game show where we pitted Canadian talent against one another to answer questions about Canadian film. And uh, it, <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, and eTalk and the Toronto Star were there to help support us. It was wonderful. And today, we we're looking for, it says savvy. We we're looking for savvy marketing insights about maximizing your audience. I'm waiting for the savvy. With some of the top notch experts in marketing and distribution. And leading that discussion is Gary Davis. Gary, that's Gary. Gary is the CEO of ERM Research in New York City, but he knows a lot about Canada. I'm just trying to qualify that because often, you know, Americans come here and they say they know what they're saying. Like coffee. <laughs> Which is now an American company. Anyway, he has done a lot of things. I'm just going to let him go on. And where are you living? <laughs> Were they sold? I don't know. We could keep going on. Anyway, uh, we're really fortunate to have Gary. We partnered with um, uh, Gary on a, um, a research document exploring the Canadian moviegoers. It's on the telephone website. Uh, I'm not going to talk anymore. You're here to listen to them. Uh, I can't thank uh, Gary enough. He did a lovely little uh, early roundtable for us. Uh, this panel is going to be great. Uh, we're really going to try and I think keep it Q&A as much as possible, so get your questions ready. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you, Fran. I think we have about four minutes left for our panel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that and thank you for listing all of the events that we were not invited to um, in the past few days, too. So, very good. That's great. Um, okay, as a, uh, no, seriously, though, thank you for that um, great introduction, and nice to see many familiar faces um, and some new faces out there, too. Um, so, as Fran was saying, uh, the panel, I think we're calling it Savvy Marketing Insights, but we initially called it some other things, um, but we'll stick with that. I think we called it like from marketing geniuses as well, so we'll try to come up with something that maybe we'll retire with by the end. But the point is that marketing today begins well before, um, well before anyone arrives on set. It begins sometimes when the pen is just hitting the paper um, or uh, the concept um, of the film. 
So what I want to do is I want to have the panel today a little discussion and look at what filmmakers can do to build a relationship with audiences early on um, and make their films more relevant um, and have a better opportunity to reach its um, audience potential. Um, in other words, I want to know how we can make a movie more marketable um, before you necessarily bring on a distributor as a partner. So let me start by introducing our panelists. I'm going to go on the end there and I'll work my way back uh, with Joanna Miles. Um, Joanna, do you know anybody in this room here? I know a couple people. Okay, so. sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, Joanna is the uh, VP of Marketing at E1 Films, and we work together on, on many films over the years, big and small. And what I love about Joanna is that she brings the same attention to a movie, whether it's an enormous blockbuster like um, one of the Hunger Games films, um, or whether it's something more intimate and artistic like the, uh, the TIFF film right now, Born to be Blue, maybe a Kokanee movie, um, or something along, along those lines. If there's ever a company that competes in both the independent and the uh, studio world, um, E1 is it. They are the largest um, distributor here in Canada. And I guess my question, just to start with you, is you are the largest distributor here. You even have a nice new building that everybody's invited to for cocktails afterwards? Uh, only if you wear a hard hat. Oh, okay. Yeah. So someday you will. But as the largest distributor in Canada, how does that help you when marketing your films? Um, or does it? Uh, it does. Uh, we, uh, we, I guess you could say we deal in volume in that we have so many titles that uh, our smaller films can take advantage of the fact that we have larger films. So, for instance, uh, when we buy TV, we buy up front, we buy a lot of TV, and then we can sort of cut it uh, to different films as the year progresses. The same with newspaper advertising. We'll buy a big block and uh, divvy it up between our titles. So. That's the pro. The con is that sometimes we have four films releasing on the same day, and each one needs the attention uh, that it deserves. So it's it's uh, a bit of a shell game, uh, making sure that uh, everything gets uh, the space it needs. And, and just quickly, and I want to get into everybody else, but like um, just a definition for everybody in this room that doesn't know about buying upfront actually means. Oh, yes. So uh, every fall, the broadcasters um, hold big parties, and they show everything that they're going to. Have, uh, spring. Well, spring, yes, sorry, spring. And then when fall happens, that's when they all premiere. Uh, so we, uh, we buy a lot of our weight up front. So that's in spring. And then you allocate it later on. Exactly. Those other films. exactly. Um, so I'm excited to have Joanne on board, and that was a huge uh, boost that she said yes. But I think she only said yes after these other two people um, agreed to come on board, too. Um, so let's move over. So Adrian Love is the uh, SVP of Marketing and Acquisitions. Um, at, I guess, sort of new Elevation Pictures. How old are you guys now? Two years uh, from this tip. Wow. Two years from this tip? Yeah, like from tip. Like it was an two years ago, and then our first movie was my, so a year and a half to my first movie. Fantastic. So I won't even say new anymore. Bleak, Bleaker's newer, we'll get to you in a second. Okay. Uh, but Elevation has an incredibly diverse um, film slate. Um, and dare I say you are working on some of the more edgier titles um, these days, bringing them to the Canadian marketplace. Um, you work on some fantastic Canadian content. You have um, Paul Gross's new uh, Hyena Road, uh, which is here at TIFF, right? Yep, yeah, it's uh, here at TIFF. Here at TIFF, you have Room, um, of course. And then probably one of the most anticipated films of the fall, On Sacrifice, right, Tyler? Uh, so no, tell us quickly a little bit about, that, that joke will make sense later when you realize that Tyler is at Bleecker Street, who is releasing that movie as well. Pause for laughter. Um, <laughs> So Adrian, tell us quickly um, a little bit about Elevation and what niche in the market you seem to be exploring. Well, Elevation, I think the uh, the niche we're trying to explore is we're trying to focus on filmmaker-driven films that are trying to have genre elements, but the potential to break out. So you use Nightcrawler as like that kind of example, and I think Upon Sacrifice that I'm working with Tyler on is also that kind of movie that kind of has, we're working with kind of established or up-and-coming filmmakers we're excited about on and they're making movies that have a, a specific target that we know we can reach and then we think it has a chance to get broader as we release the film. Great. So thanks Adrian for coming out. And then finally, um, last but not least, uh, to my left we have uh, Tyler Dinopoli, who is the president of marketing, media, and research at what we'll call this one, the brand new company, uh, Bleecker Street. Uh, actually, it's really hard to call you guys a brand new company because your team probably has more experience than most film companies out there. Um, Tyler and I know each other um, way back when we were at Miramax together years ago, and then Tyler went to Focus. 
um, did a, a brief stint at Bowtie Cinemas as well, and now is over at Bleecker, uh, which is a great group of people. And they have some great projects coming up. They have the aforementioned um, Pawn Sacrifice. Um, they did um, things along on the independent front, such as I'll See You in My Dreams. Um, and they have the up, up, upcoming Academy Hopeful, uh, Trumbo. The buzz starts here. Yes, indeed. It's Actually, it probably started last night. It did. It so now it's night. crescendoing it's today. Um, why another film company, Tyler? <laughs> why do we need that? What are you going to at Bleecker Street provide that other companies will not? Well, I think for Bleecker, part of it is our, our mission statement is to make smart and inviting entertainment for discerning audiences. So. Our goal is not to make four quadrant movies, it's to kind of make movies with an audience. They're a bit more specialized, a bit more kind of TLC driven, but also kind of the movies that, that we love to make at, at Focus Features, you know, kind of thoughtful, socially conscious movies like a Dallas Fires Club or a Trumbo. So I think it, it feels a, a, a little bit of a niche in the marketplace in terms of the, the films that I like to see as a movie tour, but also things that require a little bit more energy and love. So you're saying you're only going to release good movies? So far, so good. All right, good, good stuff. Two Rotten Tomato trophies to date. Is that right? Out of two? Out of two. Two for two. All right. <laughs> what can only go downhill from here, you know? That's not that. <laughs> now, I didn't realize we were collecting Rotten Tomato trophies, by the way. Until just, uh, but, all right. <laughs> and you have real trophies in the power too? Wow. Okay. Yeah, Metacritic's yet. I thought they maybe send you tomatoes. <laughs> uh, so, Adrian, I want to uh, kind of roll with you. And um, as Fran said, you know, I've got a bunch of questions prepared, and I want to go through this a little bit to kind of dig at some of the different things that filmmakers can do um, early on in the process. But then we definitely want to make sure we have enough time to turn it over to the audience. So, by all means, start thinking about those those good questions. And hopefully, it'll be better than my questions. Um, so, Adrian, I want to th start over with you um, because. For the many filmmakers in this room, um, filmmaking has always been that balance of art and commerce. Um, the idea of, do I want to set up to make a movie that is going to be, I hate to say a good movie or a movie that's going to make money, because it, there is an overlap for sure, but we've all been in the room where we've all walked out of a theater and we said, wow, that movie sucked, and it's crossed $200 million in North America, so that certainly does happen as well. Um, but how do you balance the merits between releasing an artistic film and making a film whose only job it is to generate box office? So when you're like looking to acquire a film, like people, let me actually give you a question as opposed to just giving a statement. Um, when you're actually looking to um, acquire a film, are there metrics that go into greenlining and acquisition to help you understand the difference between those two things? Yeah, I think that there's, uh, there's like when we go into acquiring a film, there's several metrics and financial models that our team has created. But I think the core question we always ask ourselves is, who, like, to go back to almost what I said, is who is the movie for? Because once you understand who the movie's for, you can start to understand the efficiency for spending and for marketing the movie. And so you can balance how much you think that you need to kind of spend to make that mass market movie that you're saying is only for commercial appeal versus something that may be a little more artistic that you, have, you can kind of find that one audience, that one core group, you can spend a little less, and you can get them in, uh, with the more efficient spend. At the same time, I think that the, the modern movies, it's getting harder and harder to say cheat or buy a spend. I think we're seeing in, in, through the last couple of years, through the rise of social media, through the rise of kind of more word of mouth based content, and just the so much content, it is becoming much harder to kind of have that experience of walking out of a movie and saying that's bad and not having everyone in know that would be bad very quickly. Very quickly, right away. Um, Tyler, kind of building off this a little bit is, and you said something very interesting, Adrian, you said one of the big things we have to know is who movies for. And uh, one of my favorite comments that I get from filmmakers, so one of the things that Fred did tell you is, uh, one, of, one of the things I do at my day job is we test movies. And we, we play movies for audiences and figure out how to make movies, um, help them make them better and, and whatnot. Um, but when I was running marketing at, at Weinstein, one of my favorite comments was, if the word of mouth isn't good, was always the filmmaker would say, well, the reason why the word of mouth isn't good is because you got the wrong people to see the movie. <laughs> um, and I, I always love that comment because it's like, as a marketer, I'd rather do $10 million worth of the wrong people than $5 million of the right people. But as a filmmaker, you want that $5 million of the right people, especially for a kind of word of mouth movie, which needs that $5 million not to start and then kind of grow from there. So Tyler, can you help me identify how do we figure out who those right people are, and what are some of the things that you can do to get them into the theater, and maybe what are some of those things that you can do early on to get them into a theater? 
I think, so for a company like Clicker Street, we're more kind of acquisition based in our interest too. So we go into a film and it kind of starts really at that early stage. We kind of ask ourselves three basic questions. Number one, do we like the movie? Which not everyone asks, but we ask ourselves that. Uh, number two, who's the audience? And number three, how do we reach that audience? No, number one, sorry, do you personally like the movie? Yes. That is a, it's a question we ask ourselves at this point too, because one of the things that's interesting about our model is that we can release upwards of five to ten movies a year at this point, but we're under no pressure to release ten movies, eight movies, seven movies at this point. So we can actually say these are movies we feel passionate about, movies we care about at this point, so we have the flexibility to actually release titles that we believe in. But to, to get back to some of your questions about um, identifying the audience, a lot of it starts early in kind of the research process about identifying who an individual audience is, both in terms of test screenings, but also testing materials. I'll give you an example specific to a movie that you uh, invoked earlier, I'll See In My Dreams, which is a bit more of an older skewing audience. It's uh, females, 55 plus. And one of the things that was interesting about the process for them is we kind of looked at um, some of their habits. And it, usually for a movie early on, what we would do is we tend to buy ticketing sites. For a movie like I'll See In My Dreams, we noticed that most older females tend to go directly, at least in the States, to kind of the individual theater website as opposed to the Fandangos and the movie tickets. That's this very big in Canada, too. That's excellent. Very nice. I'm among, among friends then. Um, because of that, we kind of made a conscious effort in terms of our media spend to kind of really target more lifestyle kind of areas, kind of the Martha Stewart's, the Moors.com, the places like that. And we found the engagement levels were actually in some ways higher than anything we had seen to date at this point because we were reaching them closest to where they're consuming information that wasn't necessarily entertainment specific that was so relevant to them as an audience. Um, I want to build off of something that you just said, but I want to kind of go back to another thing you said too and kind of go over to Joanna for just a moment um, and talk a little about word of mouth because these are so important for some of the movies that you just talked about, the movies that are going to need to roll out and get, get the, the buzz going. You know, word of mouth used to be the standby. It used to also be the uh, uh, the uh, the saving grace of a maybe a, a failed marketing campaign is when the film would actually uh, finally find the audience and go from there. And now you don't get that chance anymore. It's just too crowded the marketplace, and there's, the word of mouth is, um, as you guys mentioned, is just way too quick. Uh, movies like There's Something About Mary, I always get fascinated that that movie only opened to 13 million dollars on 2,000 screens, and then they're grossing 176 million dollars. Um, just the idea of a movie just 15 years ago, having that, probably a little longer than that now, having that kind of word of mouth potential and, and allowance to actually go ahead and do that um, is different. Nowadays, I don't know if a movie over to 13 um, would hold in um, that well or have the screens to hold in. So today, the formula is basically we see a movie do a third of its gross on a wide release in the first three days, or I should say the first five days, because Tuesday night we do a lot of business um, up here. But basically, we see the third of the gross um, by that point. Uh, but Facebook, Twitter, you guys talked about that. It's kind of instant. So how are these tools affecting the word of mouth movie? That's, that's for you, Joanna. Um, and how can filmmakers use these tools to their advantage? Well, uh, you know, my, my wish list is that uh, from the production stage, uh, if, the, if the filmmakers could actually start their awareness there. Um, we've had success with films like Dr. Cabby where from production, they uh, created a Facebook page, they had a Twitter handle, and they started building awareness and started uh, fans, building fans. Uh, so that by the time the film came out, there was already like a base, a fan base that we could use. So when we were doing uh, our screening program where we would uh, have word of mouth screenings, uh, there was already a pool to draw from. Um, now as, uh, so step number one on word of mouth is show it to people that are going to like your movie. Exactly. exactly. It sounds Both silly, figures. but that's obvious step number one. Yeah. So I like that idea. If we can um, have a pool of people at the beginning. So Dr. Cabby is a great example because it's a specific audience, but it's also um, a very um, reachable audience yeah. um, it, to get. So the idea is get these audience out there a little bit early and then give them the product and let them talk about it. Exactly. So you start the conversation early. Um, and you, uh, another thing that we did was uh, one of the cast members had a huge YouTube following, Superwoman. Do people know Superwoman? Okay, so she's got a million subscribers on YouTube. She lives in uh, Brampton, so she's Canadian. She, she was cast in the film, and so we gave her three featurettes, and she built uh, like little stories around them and then put them out into the marketplace for us. So again, that was another way that we were able to use uh, you know, YouTube and social media to, to again build that brand, that Dr. Cabby brand. She's your, she's your American Kevin James. 
Um, that's really interesting. We hear UGC a lot, user-generated content. You're talking about almost uh, CGC, right? Yeah. Through cast-created content. Yeah. Um, so with them. And I think that's why a lot of, uh, I just read an article the other day about how uh, stars are being cast based on their, their social media clout. And I think that helps immensely. Like you've already got uh, a pool that you uh, can pull from and, and, uh, and that can only help. Yeah, for, certainly for sure. When you look at a movie like Spring Breakers as well, that was the, the way that one certainly worked using the uh, um, uh, Selena's Facebook following. Um, I want to come over to Tyler because now I want to ask you almost a, a build on a word of mouth question, but I want to talk about the movie you just mentioned, I'll See You in My Dreams, because I'm not sure how much the audience, and I want you to talk about the audience of I'll See You in My Dreams, uh, was online. I don't know if a lot of people were walking out um, tweeting about the lights performance after that movie was over. That's safe to say. Yeah. Um, so I'll see in my dreams. Uh, let's talk about word of mouth on that one. I mean, here's a film that opened, I'll say it modestly, uh, did about 17,000 per screen, but it's now quietly gotten up to almost 8 million. Um, 7.4. I'm trying to help you out here. <laughs> That's Canadian, 8 million. <laughs> I converted. Um, it's rolling along really nicely. So it seems that word of mouth movies are not quite dead. So talk to me a little bit about what audiences were saying about that film that allowed us to get that kind of multiple off of that project. Sure, I, I think, you know, it's, it's something that we talk a lot about at Bleecker Street, and there's been a lot of articles written about it today too, about kind of the older, the older audience that really is underserved. I mean, the, the titles like A Marigold Hotel or most recently Walk in the Woods or titles like that. The thing about, the beauty about titles like this, particularly for what we did for All in My Dreams, is it was a rollout release. So it kind of moved at the pace of older movie going habits. These are not necessarily people that go to see the movie week one, or in some instances week two. And one of the things that we took a lot of pains to do is to ensure that we had a lot of kind of great critical acclaim up front with it, but we moved at the pace of kind of the audience in terms of partialing out that critical acclaim. So we put an early standee in theaters at this point, and, and the older movie-going audience you know, still goes to the theater. They do see product kind of on Netflix and other areas, but they are conditioned in the same way they read a newspaper to go to the theater. So one of the things that we tried to do early on is to, to show them some of the critical claim early, but then refresh that in theater creative once we kind of got re new reviews in and kind of new looks and things of that nature. It was something we also applied to kind of a clip strategy too. We kind of parceled out different moments and debuted them on some of those lifestyle um, sites that I mentioned earlier at this point. So they're kind of getting new tastes, new flavors of it, surrounded by the critical acclaim at this point too. And, and the word of mouth just tends to spread. I mean, the entire state of Florida showed up for this movie for us, which was great. They don't even turn up for elections. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, what can you, um, what was the word of mouth? Like, tell me like what, it, I want to be specific. I want to know, like, does it just enough for people to walk out of a movie and say, that was great, and now there's going to be word of mouth? No, I think, I think for a title like I'll See In My Dreams, one of the things we kept hearing from audiences, and this, this kind of came out of some of the early research process, too, is it was very refreshing to see an audience that didn't kind of represent old people as, as little old ladies at this point. And our, our tagline for that movie was, life goes on, go with it. And I think that was a refreshing kind of voice for that audience to hear that, look, I mean, things still happen. You still have new experiences. You can still find love. You can still keep going at this point and, and actually having second acts and third acts together. So part of what our strategy was so was to invoke those different stages of those acts at this point and partial them out in a way that audience could relate to, but also enjoy. Can you, um, anyone else um, on the group too, this is just interesting things because a lot of, there's certainly a misconception um, with working in marketing films is you put out a good movie and then the movie takes care of itself. If only it was that easy. Yeah, uh, right? That's the, actually that's always, that's my second favorite comment is, well, I'm not going to get into that, but the uh, idea of um, what the marketing support of how you actually you kind of fan the flames of a word of mouth movie. You like that little fire that first weekend and then what you have to actually do to go with it. And can you guys think of any movies that you may have done with, with good word of mouth that you've actually maybe um, come along and said, I have to give the audience, just like I have to give the actors talking points, or I have to give them the materials to, to uh, post or, or tweet about. Um, I'm actually giving the audience, I'm arming them with a way to describe the movie, because anyone see, I'll see you in my dreams? You guys are all under 60. No, nobody saw it, really? Did any of your parents see it? I'll see you in my dreams. People? This is, you didn't know we did their homework. I mean, anyone see Titanic? <laughs> All right, so they did see a couple things then. Okay, it just got it, the, it's on GOD right now, just in case. We have to change the audience that we're talking about. Um, 
the idea, this is actually more kind of one is know your audience and fail to do that. So. Um, no, but the idea is off of that very easily could be construed as it's a movie about people dying um, and giving them the right words to go with. So any examples, guys, of any word of mouth films that you may have done and how you talked about? I think uh, one of the movies, one of the early movies we released was uh, Nightcrawler, which you, which you mentioned. And I think Nightcrawler was the kind of movie that came out on uh, Halloween, and it was called Nightcrawler, and it was a dark movie. And we were very concerned that people would perceive it almost as a horror movie. So we were trying to change the conversation to, as opposed to being a horror movie, for being a thriller and using like some pretty... Uh, some quotes that kind of stretch the movie out in our campaign that would make people realize this is this is a dark journey, but it's not gonna it's you're not going there as a horror movie because we knew our core audience wasn't the young people that would go to a horror movie. It was a, a kind of older, more sophisticated audience. And the movie, by opening on Halloween, actually we needed word of mouth because obviously Halloween night is one of the most depressed nights to release a movie because people are out doing things or staying at home and. Uh, giving out candy, uh, so we had we really felt like we had to change the conversation away from the darkness of the movie while still telling people this is a thrilling ride and not setting people up because that movie is I don't know if people have seen it but that, it gets into a dark place. No, the, these audience hasn't seen any movies. Um, <laughs> just to confirm, you just said Halloween's one of the most depressing nights. Well, no, I just for <laughs> Halloween. Uh, you also did Imitation Game last year. We did do okay, Imitation Game. That was a crazy word of mouth film. And Johnny, you did King's Speech a couple years ago too. Yeah, You're, well, he won. I was I wasn't at the company. Oh, you won. Where were you? Loving that. <laughs> was that long ago already? It was that long oh my ago? God. Yes. Only someone here that worked on that movie. All right, tell me about Imitation Game. <laughs> well, Imitation Game was a movie that we just kind of we knew that it was uh, something very special from the minute we saw it, and with the, the, when we kind of were able to premiere it here and kind of had that right out of Telluride, and we could feel that wave kept on building and building. And I think we we were very much we knew we just kind of stuck to our knitting in the early marketing because we knew we weren't going to get young people. It was we were going to get kind of that older audience that was kind of we call it the varsity, the varsity audience or in Toronto or we so we made sure that we kind of had a big first opening and we actually gave it several weeks of just in Toronto just in the varsity just to have the conversation going and build that kind of need to see we finally uh, expanded it on Christmas Day but even on that expansion we kind of limited it to two or three theaters within each market despite having these great um, kind of per screen averages, um, just to make sure that people would continue to turn it into a dinner table conversation movie, where our, our, what, we kept, what we talked about in our office is we wanted people over the holidays to be sitting around the dinner table and the conversation would be, I can't believe you haven't seen this movie yet, and really driving almost sellouts to a lot of our, to a lot of our screens, so people would need to keep coming back. And it wasn't until, and this is a, often something that happens that I think Miramax and everyone does, which is it wasn't until we got the Academy Award nominations that we really went wide mainstream because wide to like national because despite the per screen averages, we knew that would just add another level of conversation and it would be kind of everyone who'd heard the dinner dinner conversations would say, oh yeah, that's the movie they were talking about because it was a hard movie to explain in like as a plot. Like si similarly, we have a movie premiering here called Room which we're really happy about and excited about, but it's a hard movie to kind of put in a synopsis. So we're trying to kind of broaden the movie out and make people kind of see the movie, start the conversation, and using Telluride and Tiff for that kind of conversation. And help direct that kind of conversation. Help, help direct the conversation. For sure. Uh, I can bring up Philomena, which when we first started was, uh, oh, the, uh, you know, the whole Irish Catholic uh, slant and trying, um, as Tyler said, when you start to introduce new material, that it's it's about Judy, more about Judy Dench, her performance, the awards are coming, and sort of change the conversation so that it's not just that movie, and also trying to get people to say Philomena correctly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that was that's the first time I heard it correctly said. Um, no one saw that one either, though. Uh, the uh, no, that's a really good example. Uh, you know, the the idea that Tyler said something that I'm still coming back to again, and, and it sounds like you guys believe this too is. Word of mouth movies take time, and the challenge with a movie taking time is, especially on the finance side, is you're putting a lot of money into a movie, and you are deferring how long you can get that movie back. I mean, most movies of the nature that we're talking about here are not making money theatrically. 
Um, they're just not. Once you get into settlements, um, P&A, production, acquisition costs, you're still in the hole. Um, once we hit that VOD number up um, area, or if you do have international rights, or you can get, you know, home video is big, once you hit that, then we start seeing um, the revenues come in. Word of mouth movie, Invitation Game, you opened it in, in uh, what was the date? Well, we we went, uh, the U.S. went on Thanksgiving, so in November. Okay, November. November. And then we went second week of December, and then we didn't go wide. Like, the movie was still playing in March. Right, so you're pushing off not only any revenues from theatrical, but now you're definitely not going in home in March, like three months after. Your windows are kind of moving up everything. So you need to, number one, like the movie and believe in the movie that you could do this. It's just an interesting thing that um, you could do that. Have you had any projects where you really believed in it, but you had to give up on it? Um, anyone that could think of that because the word of mouth just didn't kick in, but you felt like, boy, we, we, we just can't keep going financially on this, um, but I wish we could. Yeah, you know, I, not at Bleecker Street as of yet, um, but I, I'll... Because you have two trophies. Exactly. Right. <laughs> um, but I'll harken back to a, a title we had at, at Focus Features. There was a, a Don Cheadle movie that I don't know if everyone's familiar with called Talk to Me. And uh, it was a film that uh, it tested really, really well. It was kind of about a 1970s uh, disc jockey in Washington, D.C., and he is one of kind of the, the first early African-American DJs to be on the air. And the numbers were really encouraging. We all really loved the movie. We cared about it a lot. Week one came out, and it just, there, no audience showed up to it. And it was, it was difficult for us to actually discern who the audience was initially because we tried to go more art house with it. They didn't show up. So we pivoted and, and we too and tried to actually go a little bit more out of kind of the, a, a smarter kind of sophisticated urban audience and that didn't work either. Uh, so in, within the third and fourth week, we're kind of plugging away, still trying with TV, throwing more money at it. And I remember we kind of had this, this come to Jesus meeting where we sat there and we said, look, we all love this movie, we all believe in it, but we just can't find who that audience is. And ultimately we actually did discover them in the ancillaries, but they just were not there theatrically. Which is a bummer because we love this. Yeah, and it's a challenge, and I certainly know it's a challenge for filmmakers. Is all movies have audiences? It's again, what we came back to point number one: finding these audiences. Joanna, maybe something that can help out is um, we talked about social media a little bit. It's it's certainly um, on the forefront of marketing um, these days, for sure. Certainly in film, and we're probably still trying to navigate and figure out what the the, the best ideas are and how we can really kind of use it to drive box office. Um, can you tell me a few things, maybe that um, I mean, you guys did Hunger Games was very big on the social end, but something that maybe E1 has done on the social front um, that you found to be particularly effective, or something maybe that, um, well, let's stick it there. Great. Um, using our partners who have a much uh, bigger fan base than we do. Uh, for instance, we had a small film called Being Canadian. Uh, it came out uh, during Hot Docs. Uh, so for the release of the trailer, um, and this all came out just serendipitously, Serendipitously, <laughs> um, because uh, Tim Hortons was featured in the film, uh, so we just contacted Tim Hortons, and when we had our trailer ready, they uh, they agreed to release it on their Facebook page. So you all know the footprint of uh, Tim Hortons in Canada, so that was like a huge coup for us. Um, we use uh, we use Twitter a lot uh, right now for Sicario. We're doing a, a Twitter bot, which is it turns you into a drug dealer of sorts. Uh, which is uh, exactly in line with the film. Um, I suggest you check it out. It's quite uh, intricate in that you have to use code words in order to get your drug pickups and your uh, drug selling happening. Uh, is so, that real? I don't know. Is that authentic? Uh, no, some I'm of kidding. it, well, it's based on authentic. Tell me more. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's very, uh, I've been told it's very true to what happens. Uh, so things like we that. We have it. No, no, no experts that can authenticate this. No, no <laughs> definitely not. Um, okay, no, that sounds like some clever kind of things as opposed to just counting on the audience to, to do that. Uh, Adrian, one of the things I want to get over to you is uh, I want to talk about, I mean, you said, you know, Tim Hortons is in there. Maybe that should have been a, a play that was planted early on. And sometimes when you have big studio movies, that is exactly what happens. The script has gone through. We circle Donut, call Tim Hortons. Or in the states, Dunkin' Donuts or whatever. But you know, Airplane United. You know, let me reach out to them. Let me get support from them. You know, one of the challenges on independence is that doesn't happen. That process doesn't happen. The movie is getting made, and we're not thinking about marketing the movie at the time. And we joke that if you have an independent film, you know it's an independent film because you look at the poster and it's a still from the film. You know, you think of uh, Little Miss Sunshine. Oh, let's just cut out the car and put it on a yellow background. It was a fantastic image, but it was an image from. The film, you 
know, as opposed to a professional Photoshop kind of thing. So um, how can, outside the studio system, um, how can like minis and indies ensure that the raw materials um, of the campaign are at the highest standards? And how can they help this marketing get started in an earlier day? So what, what are some of the things, I'm gonna open it to all of you, that these guys can do on set to help make the movie more sellable once it does come your way? Well, I think uh, the poster is something that you said, and I think that can't be reiterated enough because that's one of the hardest struggles that like when you pick up an, an independent film or a Canadian film when there's been no set photography and there's been no like gallery shoots with the cast, and you end up trying to have to pull something from the film, it'll all, it always ends up looking, in a way, kind of, of like I want to say the word non-professional. It just kind of it does, looks to the audience. They don't they can't perceive it in the same way when they're so used to what everything else that's put in front of them looks like. And it's it's simple things like having a good like set photographer just to make sure that you have photos that can be more than just kind of the mature lighting and the kind of all the color correction that goes into a finished film. But I think that's like, a, that is a major kind of uh, benefit when, when, that is, when that comes to us and it allows us, it gives us all way more ability to kind of go in different directions and try different things as opposed to kind of being being more conceptual and maybe pushing the movie into more of a into a, to a different audience than what the movie's actually made for. I, I also think there's, there's there's simple things that kind of like registering a domain name, starting a Facebook page, which I know Joanna kind of already mentioned, starting a Twitter handle, just to kind of have that conversation. I think especially for Canadian filmmakers, like there is an industry uh, like people have started following the film industry in a way that, like, with deadline and thing that even people inside the industry, it's almost like a sports, uh, like people are following their favorite sports team. But that's very focused on American reporting, and I think Canadians, like we do have our own industry magazines, but I don't think people follow them the same way. But I think if you start that social conversation early, you can kind of start tapping into some of those elements that the the benefits that the Americans have, where people are anticipating a movie before it's even been shot. Anyone have anything to add on? I, I would add to that uh, a great unit publicist who knows how to write really great production notes um, because that's where you start steering your message, is through the production notes. I'm not saying journalists are lazy, but if you can hand them on a plate, exactly, um, you know, some uh, sound bites, some, some material that can make it that much easier for them to write their articles, write their features, prepare for their interviews with talent, that can only help. I'll add actually one thing to that too, and, and something that we're experiencing right now. So uh, Gary mentioned the, the film Trumbo, which which debuted last night and tells the story of a 1940s uh, blacklisted Hollywood screenwriter, Dalton Trumbo. And one of the things that was, was such an embarrassment of riches for us when we got it was the fact that there was all of this appropriate cataloging done on set of costumes and materials and things that were used. And they were not only cataloged well, but they were also stored properly. So one of the things we're talking about early on is there's these great kind of period costumes from the 1940s, the 1950s, all this kind of wonderful Hollywood glamour that we now have access to. So it, the, it comes to the studio to decide how to use them and ultimately in some instances we'll put them into theaters on display with the costume sketches and we'll use them for the awards campaign and things of that nature too. But that process might not have actually been able to unfold if it wasn't for the work that was done on the production in those early stages. Does E1 have access to all those things too? But of course. <laughs> um, no, that's actually really good. No, it sounds, all the things you're talking about doesn't sound very expensive. No, I mean, they're not. It, it's a lot of just kind of careful planning. I mean, another element of it, too, is just, as Adrian was invoking, too, just capturing items on set. I mean, photography is one aspect of it, but also just AV materials. I mean, one thing that's nice, and, and sometimes the quality suffers, but kind of actually doing some early interviews with your cast and with your talent while you're there on set, because nothing is going to actually make these kind of conversations more top of mind than when you're in the moment actually experiencing it. So to actually have those ability to have a starting place, we might not use all that footage for the AVs and for kind of featurettes and things like that down the road, but we at least have a starting point to build from. You had anything else on your list? I think we said. Uh... No, I think we've covered everything. Okay. Okay. Also, I, I left my list in the green room. Oh. <laughs> she said she had seven things, and that's. Uh, I don't know. I'm a green room. Wasn't even green in there. Um, okay. What I want to do is, um, I have a couple more questions, but um, I do see there are already some movement of loosening hands. 
uh, and I see a microphone out there too. So I'd love to turn it over to you guys. Um, it is fantastic people here. Let's, let's, let's hit them with harder questions than I've been asking them. You can choose, not him. Hi, Thank, thanks for being here. Um, so the question, uh, I guess to everybody, uh, just as entities who acquire films, how much do you value and how much do you, um, I guess, suggest that filmmakers do that sort of early marketing campaign, social media, when they when they do, before you get involved? Like how much of a value is it to you and how, how, how you, when, when you assess the film, does that bring any additional weight when you see that lots of work is done in that regard? It's a good question. You want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. I, I think it, it is important. I, and one of the things that, that Adrian said too is just kind of registering those domain names early, particularly if you kind of have a, a title that you feel strongly about, identifying that Facebook page early. But one of the things that works best for us on the distribution side is we're probably going to take a, a different approach and, and work collaborative with you to kind of come up with an appropriate sell for it. So one of the things that's tricky early on, and we ask filmmakers not to do this, is not to post too much too often at this point too, because sometimes you're going down a cell in a road in an audience that might necessarily not be who we're ultimately gonna wind up selling the movie to. So I think there's a lot of groundwork to be laid, but kind of leaving a little bit there for the studio process of it. One of the things that's always easier for us too is, and I know it's hard, particularly at a film festival, is there's kind of this urge to, to debut a photo early, or to debut a clip early. I'd encourage you guys as much as you can to kind of hold back those elements too because it's just going to make that process with the studio that much more collaborative with identifying what that first image is. I guess the challenge is though, sometimes there's not necessarily going to be a studio if you don't um, release that clip, if you don't release that 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 image. So I think the, the idea we said is just be more judicious of what has actually gone out. I like the other thing that jo Joanna said too, and what I've actually personally seen is the right number of followers on a an actor or a director can certainly help move things as well. I gotta mention for a hyena, Paul's got a huge following. Yeah, well I think Paul's Paul does have a, a huge following. I don't think he's very active on social media, but I think uh, Paul is I, and I didn't mean just social, I meant like in general. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that the, you like Paul is the, the central cell of the movie and I think that and it's his vision and he's excited to talk about it. So I know once we we worked with him from the beginning and he kind of all the things we've kind of discussed, domain names, and we got some great AV from when he shot the film when he was in Jordan. So there was a lot of benefits that we've been able to use. If uh, I know these, I know the audience that doesn't see movies, but the Cineplex pre-show has had some footage from that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think like it's hard to say. Like I think the question was kind of how much do you value it, and I think it, it's really additive. Like when it comes to acquiring a movie, it's never going to be a tipping point because I think we like when you. When a film's a finished film, as Tyler kind of mentioned, like we do as distributors want to love the movie or see right. something in the movie, and I think the marketing tools are just an additive as opposed to something that's going to. Yeah, happen. but the idea that a brand is involved is a very big, and Paul is a brand. That's why I brought that up. That he's a brand, and if you guys built your own brand socially, that that does help. Absolutely, in a sense. absolutely. It's icing on the cake. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. So um, I just wanted to go back to something that um, you said earlier that really. Are you taking of, minutes? You're taking minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned that you know independent filmmakers are never really interested in product placement, and um, I'm a producer, and my background is actually. I don't think I said that. Okay. Not interested, but okay. okay. Um, maybe I'm skewing the words, but anyways, my background is in um, cell media uh, market research, so I love the concept of product placement, and that is actually one of the first things that I look for in a script. Um, one of the challenges I face as an independent producer is finding those, con making those conversations happen, finding the brands, and figuring out how to get them to actually listen to me or sit down with me to talk about those opportunities. Yeah, that, and that's exactly what I was meaning by it's tough oh, okay. for the independent world, so. Okay, so um, my question is, do you have any suggestions or tips or um, ways that we can sort of open those dialogues with those brands that we want to partner with in, from the independent world? Uh, we have a, a national promotions team that handles uh, that for us. They have a great Rolodex. Um, so when we take a film on as a distributor, uh, you know, we plunder that Rolodex for sponsorship or um, any way that we could do contesting with them, anything to uh, amplify our message. So, I mean, if you're, if you're aligned with a distributor, they should 
help you with that. Right, but the challenge is when you're not a distributor, right, how do you get that as an independent? How do you get it in the pre-production stage where you're finding financing and you want to revolve them from the get-go? One of the things that you can do is you mentioned your market research. Right. Um, one of the challenging things that you can do is make a good case with data. That's one of the biggest things that these brands want is data. I have friends that do this at studios um, as well, and even the biggest brands want, want the data. And there are a lot of actually independent product placement companies out there and promotional <coughs> companies that will take your property and do that. And I know you're not talking about doing that because you don't have the money to bring them on in. But um, do the research on your property. It's, it's cost efficient to do that and make the case and um, it's going to be hard you're getting that rolodex to knock on doors that's usually where the the barriers of who actually talk to on it but an independent film that has the data to show that it might actually succeed um, should get some attention yeah and i think you similarly i think if you do have your cast that we've talked about with social media following or any kind of following that's they're going to be looking to that uh, great place to get data from. To get to take the data from, yeah. And if they can get kind of posts from those people, it's kind of there is a bit of a trade there that they might look, look into. Yeah, this is a great panel. I was interested that you're telling independent filmmakers to think about our electronic press kit and get a photographer on set. But there is building a buzz and yet not releasing information. So we're, we're kind of walking that tightrope of how do we do both <laughs> and um yeah what, what's your 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 take on how do we sort of get people to start you know like because i'm already building a following for my horror comedy that i'm doing and i've got like a couple thousand followers and i've already started trying to get that up there with horror enthusiasts but how do i walk that line I think one thing that's, it, it is tricky and it's a slippery slope because um, part of it is kind of actually gathering all those materials and cataloging them and, and have enough at your disposal because some of the best conversations I've always had after we've required a film is to sit there and just kind of talk to the director and, and the, the, the cast and just say, what was your process for the movie and what do you have at your disposal at this point? And the wealth of knowledge sometimes when you guys have AV assets and you have kind of domain names registered and all of those things, it, it just it makes the conversation flow that much more naturally and I can hear where you're coming from, we can talk about our opinion about the movie and it becomes a really collaborative process. So it's it's hard to say, you know, what is appropriate in terms of gathering Facebook fans and likes and, and, and such early on too because you do want to kind of get those fans initially in there and kind of have your earlier champions. But once your film is acquired, I, I, I promise you, we will come along on the journey together at this point. And honestly, all of those assets that you have, it, it, it's so hard to hold back on in some instances, they will be put to good use. They'll be put to good use together. And, and I think the point is, make sure you have them. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Have those assets yeah. in the first place, yeah. And what is it? Is it like shooting like photographers just a white seamless? Like just get images and costume? Yeah, we've seen it. We've seen it in all sorts. I mean, some have been shot, of course, green screen backgrounds. Some are kind of specific on set. And, and a lot, in many instances, I know it's tough on independent productions too. Budgets are tight. Quality is not going to be great. But it's a starting point. There are some instances where we've kind of gone in and presented what we refer to as scrapbooks. Where we kind of look at and filmmakers come in and they 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 bring but photographs from sets and they just talk about this was the environment this was kind of what the air was like this is the the way that the kind of ground look and all about it all of that is so directionally helpful as we put a campaign together because we start thinking about color schemes and landscapes and all of those elements so even if the quality is not there for us to ultimately wind up using them and we might redo some of those elements the conversation is still having at this point and you're actually bringing us onto the set with you the process that we unfortunately missed out on. Hi, my name is Joanne Fishburne. Uh, this is building on the question about sponsorship, uh, sorry, sponsors and uh, partners. And I'm just curious who the decision maker was at Tim Hortons. You know, so when we're directing, you know, our, you know, questions or, uh, you know, yeah, invitations. Do you have your email address or phone number? <laughs> yeah, is it, is it, no, is it, no, 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 it's more like. <laughs> it was Tim. Who's the VP <laughs> um, no, of? You know, is it the VP of marketing, communications? What's the lead time that you recommend in terms of reaching out? I mean, obviously that's just a promotional ask, not, and um, so I was just kind of curious, just because these things take time. Yes. So that was just one in terms of them just promoting what you're doing. But the other thing is if you're actually asking for money, um, 
who is the right person to target and then what's the lead time you recommend for that as well? Uh, we've been working with Tim Hortons for I don't know, five, seven years or so. So when, uh, when we put the ask in, we already had a shorthand with them. So I think we turned it around in like four weeks. Um, so, I mean, that's a luxury that we have because of the breadth of our, our film slate. Um, and it's with their, I think it was their marketing department, but it was done through our national promotions publicity department. So it's, I mean, it's just knowing the right person to ask and, and having a relationship and uh, What's Where's the starting lucky. place for these guys? Like, where's the starting place, like, to go in through, um, like, the, their ad agency or to go in straight through the brand managers at the companies themselves? I would say probably going to a Tim Hortons. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I would say the, the, mar the marketing department, the brand marketing. That's where you should start. And they might lead you on a merry chase, but eventually you'll get to the right person. Yeah, and I think you have to go ahead and be uh, relentless at that. Yeah. But you were not asking money from the post promotion. Exactly. So then maybe we'll go just over four years. So he's the Harvest God. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Dave. I was just uh, curious about how important it is attaching stars to films, with there being so many films being released these days. I, I think there's, there's always kind of, it, it, it always makes things easier. Like, I think that kind of when people, when we're, because I think when we go to an acquire a movie, we often think about kind of the trailer and I think and the poster like right away and I think when you have a star it makes things a lot easier for in your mind as I'm sure all you can imagine when you have that star you understand how the way the image the trailer is going to flow and the way that you understand what's going to draw an audience in it also clarifies you know, the demo, what we've been talking about kind of who your demographic is because <laughs> I think there's some stars that will fit for the right type of movie and there's some stars that won't. And there's people like, uh, I'll see you in my dreams. I know we had a huge reaction to Sam Elliott, which is kind of for that demo, they were completely focused on him. And I don't know, like, I think he's a fantastic actor. I think he's, I'm not trying to, but I don't think that when you're seeing a star, you might not think Sam Elliott at the top of your head. But for that demo, he was completely a star. And I think a similar person in a completely different genre would be someone like Bruce Campbell for horror fans. Like, he will absolutely be that, be a star. So I think it's about, like I think it's it's an almost impossible question to ask because it's kind of it's going to be so variable. But I think that for a movie, for when you're thinking about an audience, there's obvious the shortcut, the shorthand that marketers are always looking for, and a star is like a massive shorthand that the audience will understand what that movie is, what that role is, and then there's then there's often movies where you can kind of play on that and even take people in different directions. But I think it's always that quick shorthand. Yeah, and one of the other interesting things about talent too is, um, you know, talent and genre are really help to um, to your question about trying to get somebody on board with data. It's like you can easily identify who the fans are of this person, just like you can say who comes to see horror movies. So anything you can do as an independent, you're trying to put some data on getting money or data on the studio. It, it certainly helps with that too. Besides just the marketability. Yeah. We got time for one more question. I'll ask it if no one else has it. Don't have it done, not her. <laughs> <laughs> We've all got questions, but mine is just quick. Um, with respect to the data, what type of data is most helpful to be showing in talking to marketers? In terms of the early stages that, that you would bring to the fold? I think anything that any research that you've done to date at this point, I mean, in some instances you might be conducting research screening, so that kind of basic information, but also anything directionally helpful that you feel like has been relevant on set. I mean, there have been kind of moments that uh, I remember there was a production that we worked on at Focus that they had kind of they had spent a lot of time shooting in kind of coffee shops and things of that nature, and they had said, you know. It was really interesting, kind of females particularly seem to stop and ask us a lot more questions about this title than, than men. And we kind of said, you know, why do you think that is? And ultimately it kind of got that dialogue starting about who you thought your audience was and then who we might perceive as it too. But these were kind of early directional kernels that kind of actually started invoking the conversation a bit. Yeah. 
don't know if that completely answers your question, but <laughs> okay. Should we allow one more question, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Wake up, people. <laughs> uh, my question is how how do you feel about putting a movie to, on to straight to VOD versus trying to get theatrical if we don't have the stars, but we still have an interesting story that's very independent that we've built something? So would that be something you, you do as well, is that you say this film really, we won't put it for in this territory or whatever as just a straight VOD? I would say, you know, one of the things that um, we're asked a lot too, because Bleecker Street isn't kind of tied to um, Universal or any of the bigger studio systems. So we have deals in place. We're working with uh, Netflix to release *Beats of No Nation*, or working with Amazon to release *Elvis and Nixon* next year, which is a, a title with Michael Shannon. But one of the things we, we talk a lot about with filmmakers when they acquire a title is we want to find where the audience is, irrespective of what that means. So, you know, for I'll See You in My Dreams, it was kind of an older audience. Those audiences tend to go more to the, the theaters directly at this point. But that's not to say if we acquired a title like Snowpiercer or something like that that the Radius put out, that audience actually can play in both of those sandboxes. And it, it's difficult now because exhibitors don't really fully understand or they are willing to work with us about the windowing process as to when something can come out on a VOD and in theater at this point. So it is a bit of a balancing act, and we're all kind of playing in this space a little bit. But it's all about kind of doing what's most appropriate for the audience. And we're fire I don't know. I'm a connected I, exhibitor, though, so I can say these things. <laughs> he did it now, he understands it. He did it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's even harder for us here in Canada because we have uh, a monopoly uh, with our exhibitor, and uh, they refuse to pay the date, so we have to scramble a bit. Um, and use a lot of independent theaters if you, if you do that. But, uh, uh, you know, we take a look at the film and then we decide <coughs> if it's, you know, theatrical or if it's VOD. And we've had great success. Uh, we just did uh, The Search for Freedom, um, which was a straight to VOD. And uh, John Long, who was the director of that film, he had a fan base that had been following him for the past five years. He does surf and extreme sports uh, films. Um, so with uh, Cineplex Alternative Programming, we picked the 23 best theaters for that type of film, released it on two nights, uh, and, uh, and he you know, blasted out to his fan base over Facebook and Twitter, and the numbers were really good. So you know, we're, we're open to it, it has to be for the right film, you know, it's, a, it's a long discussion, but it's, it's definitely doable. We're out of time. You guys have places to be. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching.